Welcome to this evening's lecture, sponsored by the Center for Catholic Studies. We are particularly honored this evening to be joined by faculty and staff of Fairfield Bellarmine, members of the Catholic Studies Advisory Board, and in a special way at this Bellarmine lecture, members of the Fairfield Jesuit community. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. This is the first e event in our public lecture series this spring. In March, we will join the Bennett Center for Judaic Studies to welcome Annette Yoshiko Reed from Harvard Divinity School, speaking about ancient Judaism between Christian memory and Jewish forgetting. And in April, we will host the annual Commonweal Lecture given by Boston Law Professor Kathleen Cavaney, who will speak on nostalgia and American public life, surely a timely topic. A three-part online series on Catholicism and gender will run through the spring as well. We have flyers about all these interesting events at the back table. I would also like to offer a heads up for another major lecture, launching a partnership between America Media and the College of Arts and Sciences. On Monday, March 18th at 7 o'clock p.m. in this very room, the Most Reverend Mark J. Zeitz, Bishop of El Paso, will speak about the U.S. Church in our current context, offering a lecture titled, intentionally, Immigration, the American Story. We have much to look forward to, but tonight. The Bellarmine Lecture has been a feature of the Center for Catholic Studies since the early years of its existence, named to highlight Fairfield's patron saint, the 16th century Jesuit Robert Bellarmine featuring a distinguished member of the Society of Jesus, and sometimes a layperson well-versed in Jesuit education, this lecture has touched on many themes, Fairfield's own history, democracy and liberal education, women in the Ignatian tradition, and the ecological vision of Pope Francis. This year is a milestone. We are not only featuring a Jesuit who is now part of our Fairfield community, he will be speaking about an important new initiative that bears the Bellarmine name at Fairfield, speaking to new life now on an extension of the Fairfield campus in North Bridgeport. To address the vision of this initiative and to introduce this evening's speaker, I invite you to welcome Dr. Mark Nemec, the president of Fairfield University. Dr. Nemec. Thank you so much, Nancy, and thank you all for joining us. I just wanted to take a brief moment and place the Fairfield Bellarmine Initiative in context. And that context is one that I think is extremely important for us, not just as Fairfield University, but for us as a work of the Society of Jesus. And it is this. We know that the Society has been dedicated to education for 500 years, since its very founding. But one of the things that has characterized Fairfield University's upholding of that tradition is the idea that we need to translate that for the 21st century. And that means a number of things, but most specifically it means making sure that we continue to reach ever broader populations in ever more innovative ways. And so it was that thought as background that motivated myself and a number of people. In fact, this idea really was not first Fairfields, it was first established at Loyola Chicago with the notion that a bridge program, a pathway program, seeking those students who wanted to further their education, but for whom a two-year program was most appropriate with the support of a community and one that ensured that they saw access as being attainable was what motivated us. But I also wanna stress that in founding Fairfield Bellarmine, there is never a thought that this is anything other than a Fairfield education, right? This is an education that is grounded in what we do best, in the fact that we are educating young men and women to be children of God, to set the world afire, and to live lives of purpose. And stressing that in that education, we build from some core basic learning objectives, the ability to communicate, the ability to think across fields of inquiry, and the ability to think of the other in the Jesuit Catholic social and intellectual tradition. In addition to that though, it is also animated by what I would say are three notions of purpose or pursuits. First and foremost, as our motto states, perfidum ad plenum veritatum, through faith to the fullness of truth. 
So as with any educational apostolate, we and our students and our community are in pursuit of truth. But secondly, and I think this especially resonates in this day and age, is the notion that we do so in pursuit of justice. And Father O'Brien will speak in greater depth about that. But that truth isn't just for knowledge's sake, but it is for something greater. But lastly, it's also the notion, and I think above all, the Father General of the Society has put this in words that are so elegant in terms of accompanying our youth in a hope-filled future, it's the pursuit of grace. So truth, justice, and grace animate all of Fairfield's educational apostolates, but specifically and most recently with the establishment of the Bellarmine Initiative, it animates it in that little corner of the east end of Bridgeport that really I think will be a model, not just for this region, but we hope for the nation and the world as a whole. So I thank you for making the time to spend with us for hearing a little bit about that Fairfield Bellman story. Without further ado, let me introduce my good friend, our Vice Provost and Executive Director of the Bellman Campus, Father Kevin O'Brien. Well, it's very good to be with you all tonight to see so many friends from the two campuses, uh, and above all to acknowledge we have uh, students from Bellarmine and parents from Bellarmine and family members from Bellarmine and faculty from Bellarmine and our staff members. So it's so good to see you and good for us to be together as a community. We have our friends from uh, the neighborhood as well who are joining me in reflecting on uh, what is the role of Jesuit higher education in the context of this particular initiative that Mark Nemec has described. And I just do want to say this would not have happened without Mark's leadership and the board's support. So very grateful, Mark, to you. So, um, so thank you for engaging in what we hope will be, we know will be an interesting conversation, uh, that I will offer some remarks uh, tapping into the history of Jesuit higher ed, the present of Jesuit higher ed. And then most importantly, as you see previewed, we have three of our students who will then join me in the conversation. So um, let us begin. So in 1551, Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, wrote to the Jesuits of a newly founded college in Italy. And in the first part of the letter, he instructed the Jesuits there, as you see behind me, to endeavor to conceive great resolves and elicit equally great desires to be true and faithful servants of God. Now, not surprisingly, the last part of that same letter had to deal with fundraising. <laughs> so some things have not changed in Jesuit higher ed. But this is a remarkable letter that Ignatius wrote to Jesuits starting a school. So I want to spend our time tonight reflecting on what was Ignatius getting at when he told his Jesuits there to elicit great desires. Now, the language of great desires may sound strange coming from the founder of a religious order. Indeed, for centuries before, the church was suspicious of desires. They were something to be tamed. Ignatius, who as a Basque from northern Spain, was full of passion and bold desires and grand ideals, he looked at desires differently. In a sense, he helped redeem desire in the Christian tradition by casting desire as natural and God-given and fundamentally good. Now, sure, we all know desires can get us into trouble if we blindly follow them. But for Ignatius, every interior movement, feelings, emotions, attractions, repulsions, and desires must be discerned. And from his own experience, Ignatius learned that some desires, especially the deep ones, are cues to what God wants for us. Why? Because God, our creator, put those desires in us in the first place. So we do well, all of us, we do well to notice and then to embrace them. For deep desires have something to tell us about God's desire for us and God's dream for the world. So let me tell you where we'll go in our time together. In this lecture, I will reflect on the role of desires and the virtue of magnanimity, which is so important in Ignatian spirituality and I will say Jesuit education. 
I will explain how eliciting great desires and then refining them can lead to transformation of persons and of the communities of which they are a part. I will further describe how educators in the Jesuit tradition are called to help their students grow in interior freedom so that they can realize their God-given promise. And finally, I, I will call upon students from Fairfield Bellarmine, where, where I spend my days gladly, to show how great desires come to life in exceptional, kind, committed, and talented young people. So, desires. Desires are powerful stuff. Any human being knows that, of whatever age. The Greek philosopher and historian Plutarch wrote long ago, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. True enough. After a certain age, education should not primarily be about filling the mind, nor should it be just about getting a grade, though we give them. And there is some extra credit floating around this room tonight. <laughs> Fine, fair enough. And education is not even about getting a job primarily, though we need those jobs and it's important. Education in the Jesuit tradition is about those things, but more. Desires are fuel for that fire of inquiry, fuel that propels our search for truth and beauty and goodness. That is our search for God. So we elicit desires, surely. But then we need to hone and refine them. For if we just tap into those desires and unleash them, those desires will quickly dissipate or become so diffused and scattered that they do, they do no one any good. It might even get us into trouble. These are lessons that St. Ignatius learned in the course of his own conversion. Full of passion and grand ambitions, Ignatius realized that he needed to refine his desires and direct them so that he could better serve God's glory and, as he wrote so often, help souls, help people, and not waste those desires, nor inflate his own ego. Reflecting on this stage of his life, Ignatius wrote that God was working with him as a teacher works with a child, personally and patiently schooling and shaping his desires and his dreams. An appropriate metaphor for us as we consider education in the Jesuit tradition. Early on when we were building our um, school in Bridgeport, Nakia and PJ and Jerry and Anissa and Wendy and Melissa and I got together on cold January day and reflected on our emerging mission in light of this tradition of Jesuit education. And at the end of that day, we concluded that the mission of Fairfield Bellarmine is this, to provide a, Catholic, a Jesuit and Catholic education that is accessible and affordable and empowers underrepresented students to realize their God-given potential and serve their communities. You could say that we, and then all the good people who have joined us since on our adventure are playing with matches, kindling that fire of the mind and heart, empowering young people for the good, eliciting and refining great desires just as Ignatius ba imagined back in 1551 to those Jesuits opening a school in Italy. So we should ask, if we're supposed to elicit great desires, what makes a desire great? Now, there is nothing wrong with normal run-of-the-mill desires that define any day. I love chocolate, I say. Or you may say, I love the Yankees, or I love Taylor Swift, or whatever show you're streaming on Netflix. These are all fine desires. But what distinguishes these very human desires from really great desires is that great desires impel us to serve others. So in a speech to the International Association of Jesuit Universities at Boston College in 2022, Arturo Sosa, who is Ignatius's successor and current superior general of the Jesuits, 
considered such greatness. And he said this, the spirituality that flows from the charism of the society of Jesus understands the full life to be one that always seeks in everything to love and to serve, quoting St. Ignatius. This is how we conceive of excellence. Such excellence or greatness multiplies. In 1551, Juan Alfonso de Polanco, Ignatius's trusted secretary, wrote another letter. Jesuits wrote a lot of letters back then and still do. Polanco wrote a manifesto of sorts at Ignatius's direction, explaining why Jesuits got into the education business, which ironically, we never intended to do at our founding. That's another story. But at the end of his list of 14 reasons we should be involved in education, we find this statement. In short, since young people turn into adults, their good formation in life, in life and learning will benefit many others with the fruit expanding more widely every day. The so-called multiplier effect. Good people do good things. But understand, this objective is more than just being charitable or nice or pious. Because love ought to transform people and institutions and cultures. So let's go back to that letter that Ignatius wrote to the, Spanish, to the, uh, to the Jesuits opening the school. The middle part, just before he gets into the bit about fundraising, instructs the Jesuits about what they should be doing for the profit of the city, as he wrote. And he listed a number of things that we should do for the city that we're a part. Teaching students certain subjects, we still do that. Forming their character, we do that. Offering the sacraments, we do that. Giving the spiritual exercises, yes. Ministering in hospitals and jails, yeah. You get the idea. It sounds pretty typical for a bunch of priests and brothers to do. But now listen to how Ignatius closes his letter to those Jesuits opening a school. You should never lose sight of the greater service of God, the common good, and the good name of the society. Greater service of God. Well, that makes sense for a religious order. But that second part, serve the common good. This is extraordinary for a religious order, as Jesuit historian John O'Malley reminds us, for the Jesuits to bring into their mission statement this very secular philosophical term that dates back to the ancient and pagan world. It's in the heart of the mission of a Jesuit school, a school founded by a religious order. It reflects the concern not just for the stuff of heaven, but of earth. In the 20th century, the common good was enshrined in Catholic social teaching. According to this tradition, the common good is the sum total of all conditions that allows people as individuals or communities to thrive. In his talk at Boston College, Father Sosa incorporated this notion of the common good into the mission of a Jesuit university. He continued, the transmission of knowledge as a, fundamental, as a fundamental dimension of the university's task contributes to the formation of well-integrated persons, committed to the transformation of society, agents of reconciliation who struggle for social justice. Father Sosa's predecessor, Adolfo Nicolas spoke to senior leaders at Jesuit universities in the United States in 2013. And he was talking to them about what leadership should be for our schools in the US. And he shared a similar conviction so beautifully. The principal function of a leader at a Jesuit school is to help the members of the community grow to become the living presence of God in the world. How beautiful. Now, the challenge, in the Ignatian concept of service, growth leads to transformation. 
If there is no transformation, then the school is not Jesuit. The ultimate objective is an individual's transformation and through individuals, the transformation of society. It turns out that Jesuit education is not just about lighting a flame. It's starting a wildfire. Given this mission to serve the common good, and given the call, this call to transformation, and given how grand God's dream for the world is, and given the cost of such great endeavors, you can see why Ignatius wanted his teachers then and now to elicit great desires. Too much was at stake. The virtue they were to model and instill in their students was magnanimity. Such a great virtue we don't talk about anymore. Magnanimity. It means, from the Latin, having a great soul or being large-hearted. That describes our students at Fairfield Bellarmine. In his catalog of virtues in the Summa Theologica, St. Thomas Aquinas described magnanimity in this way. The stretching forth of the mind to great things. A virtue that makes a person deem himself worthy of great things in consideration of the gifts he holds from God. So there it is. In our tradition, a thousand years ago, Aquinas was talking about elicit, eliciting great desires to do great things. But note, it is not for an ego trip or building a resume. We want to do great things out of gratitude for the gifts God has given us. Grateful for God's generosity to us, we only want to give back, to respond generously by offering those gifts to other people, by instilling the virtue of gratitude in our students, and by students cultivating it in one another. Educators in the Jesuit tradition refine and shape those desires for the greater glory of God and the good of others. Now, moving to the contemporary scene, in the last 50 years, this magnanimous impulse has been characterized by a popular catchphrase, the magus. Originally an adverb in Latin, meaning more or to a greater degree, magus is a word that we often find in Ignatius' own writings. And today, though, we now make the magus a verb, as I'm doing, I'm sorry, a noun, as I'm doing, such as strive for the magus. See, the magus is a holy boldness to take on new challenges, to stretch for God's greater glory in new situation and, and towards new frontiers, to go to the peripheries, as Pope Francis often says, to both serve others and to learn from them in a spirit of mutuality. We strive for the magus, for excellence, not as a call to perfectionism or workaholism, but as a summons to live for something or someone greater than ourselves. We not only want to do good, but do better. Never content with easy answers. Never content with settling just for how things are. Always willing to ask the next question. Always willing to take a noble risk. We here at Fairfield University and other Jesuit universities, we cultivate this generosity of spirit, this largeness of heart, this great souledness by helping our students grow in freedom. And by freedom, I don't mean license, do whatever we want. The Ignatian understanding of freedom is an interior sense of freedom, to be free from all the stuff that we carry that gets in the way of our loving God and loving ourselves and loving others and loving our, all of creation. Freed from our interior baggage, we are free to love and serve as we are called, freedom. So what's some of this inter internal luggage we carry around a campus or in a classroom or into our relationships? Well, it, it could be different because there's so many different people here, but here's some common ones. There are biases and prejudices that limit our vision and close our heart. There's rigidity and the need to control. There's an excessive concern for what other people think. There's insecurity masked as arrogance. 
Oh gosh, and there's fears of all different kinds. Fear of what is new or different, fear of commitment, fear of failure. Do you know that 366 times in the Bible there is some version of the phrase, do not be afraid? 366 times in the Bible, do not be afraid. Fear is part of who we are as human beings. These are all very human, very common unfreedoms. And sadly, voices from our upbringing and our culture can sometimes only amplify those fears or insecurities. Voices that say you are not good enough or you are not good. Voices that say you must look a certain way or act a certain way to deserve it. Voices that say you are not worthy. These are voices that have especially been imposed on minoritized and marginalized communities. Now recall Aquinas' definition of magnanimity. Magnanimity makes the person deem himself worthy of great things. Part of Ignatian freedom is to instill in our young people and in one another a strong conviction that they are worthy and that God has given them certain gifts and that the world needs those gifts to be shared in order to realize God's dream for the world. In the spirit of Cora Personalis, educators in the Jesuit tradition must know our students personally so that we can co cultivate and call out those gifts specifically. This tradition gives us permission to, to love our students, to love them for who they are and whom God calls them to be. At a Jesuit university, we can talk about love proudly, without apology or excuse or explanation. Queer personalis is an antidote to the imposter syndrome which makes some students think that they don't deserve what other students, often those with certain privileges, enjoy. It makes them think, I don't belong here. And to that we say, you are worthy because you are a beloved child of God. A final caution about magis language. Sometimes we talk about magnanimity and greatness as if we need to outdo someone else or to be number one or become famous or make a lot of money. That may happen. And if you make a lot of money, give it to Fairfield Bellarmine. <laughs> but for most of us, we're not going to become famous and we're not going to make a lot of money. So we have to be careful that eliciting great desires and striving for the magis does not fuel perfectionism that drives us crazy or competitiveness that divides us. There's so many other ways to consider greatness, isn't there? To these all too familiar tendencies, Pope Francis offers a really gentle corrective, urging us to balance magnanimity with humility. Like gratitude, humility is a virtue that hones desires so that they are well ordered. Just soon after becoming Pope, in 2013, he spoke to young people at Jesuit universities in Italy. And this is what he said about magnanimity. The main element, the main element at a school, a Jesuit school, is to learn to be magnanimous. It means to have a great heart, having greatness of mind. It means having great ideals, the wish to do great things in response to what God asks of us. It means also to do well the routine, daily actions, tasks, meetings with people, doing the little everyday things with a great heart open to God and others. A great heart open to God and others. In other words, Jesuit education offers a countercultural perspective to see things not as the world or social media often sees things, but as God does. The one who casts down the mighty from their thrones and lifts up the lowly. The one who loves the underdog, at least as the Bible tells us repeatedly. Whether Christian or not, we can adopt the perspective of Jesus who saw great things in the smallest. In a mustard seed, in a pinch of yeast, a couple of coins, a few fish and loaves of bread. And above all, he saw greatness in people whom others easily dismissed and overlooked. People who, with great love, make the world better and make our lives easier and more pleasant and joyful. In considering this type of greatness, I'm reminded of the words of George Eliot, those majestic, even haunting words that close her novel Middlemarch. 
read with me. Speaking of her main character, Dorothea, she ends the novel in this way. Her full nature spent itself in channels which had no great name on earth, but the effect of her being on those around her was incalculably diffusive. For the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts. And that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. Now, Fairfield Bellman takes up just an acre or two of land in a corner of Bridgeport, a city that is often overlooked, a drive-by on 95. We want people to look. Even though we might be small over there, our inaugural, our inaugural class some of whom you will meet tonight, are only 44 students with about 200 students at our capacity. And these students, these 44, chose to come to a school that had no buildings, no students, and no faculty. <laughs> but they all believed in a mission. That's why we love them. They trusted us, and they resonate with this mission. Small by many measures, we are doing great things at Bellarmine. When you come to our campus, and you will, and you will, when you come to our campus, you will see it, and more so, you will feel it. We are brimming over with great desires, not just students, but faculty and staff. We are all being transformed so that we can transform higher education and the communities that we come from. From our holy hill in Bridgeport, we look at the world differently. A fresh perspective sorely needed as we consider our own work as a university. We do everyday things with a great heart open to God and others, and that is no better displayed than in our students, whom I have the honor of introducing you tonight. I wish I could bring, there's, a, there's like 20 of them here. I wish I could bring you all up, but I offer you three of their friends. They will share with you their own great desires for themselves, their families, and our community. By whatever measure, I am confident that they and their classmates will do great things by any measure. So please welcome Catherine Garcia Flores, Joshua Dixon, and Ronaldo Fong. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> God, I'm sorry. You're good. Good evening. You're, you're good. <laughs> good evening, everyone. Hi, Josh. Hi. I would like to start by thanking Reverend Father O'Brien for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. Being not only considered, but chosen to share my experience is not something I take lightly. And I think my heart rate at the moment is very telling of that statement. My name is Joshua Dixon, and I'm a proud member of Fairfield Bellarmine's inaugural class of 2025. As a recent graduate of Fairfield Prep, class of 23, go prep, I am no stranger to the values of Jesuit Catholic education, formed through centuries of dedication to academic excellence, the pursuit of knowledge, and a commitment to holistic growth for the greater glory of God, or ad memoriam de gloriam. I finally have a reason to use that term after being tested on it freshman year. <laughs> Within my last seven years of Catholic education, I also went to a Catholic middle school, I've studied the virtuous lives of many saints, martyrs, activists, and other people of that nature. However, the most relevant figure to me as I navigate everyday life is my sister, Anna. In February of 2014, my mom lost her fight to breast cancer after enduring the disease for most of my early childhood. However, it took me a few years to realize that I never lost her in the slightest bit. In times of intense mental and financial hardship for us, my sister took it upon herself to keep raising me as she had been doing years prior. Not to mention that she already had two children of her own to raise, my nieces, Mariah and Victoria. Over time, I arrived at this sort of epiphany that made me realize, yes, my sister did become my mother, but I didn't lose her either. I actually gained two more sisters, thanks to my nieces. 
Outside of this, I do realization, you know, they can be pretty annoying, and I take it upon myself to make that very clear to them, but my point still stands. It is easy for me to draw parallels between my sister's actions and the Jesuit mission. In everything she has done for me exists core Jesuit values such as the commitment to service and emphasis on higher education. As with any endeavor in life, meeting the criteria of these values was not a walk in the park. I was under a lot of pressure to not cause disappointment in her and other people in my life that were rooting for me. As an example, I'm still recovering from whatever mental shift took place during the pandemic, which started when I was a freshman in high school. I think I speak on behalf of most people my age when I say that I've become more cynical and perhaps hopeless about the state of the world, which then bleeds into our everyday livelihoods as well. This is why the Jesuit mission of eliciting great desires is more important than ever. To do so is to cultivate a new sense of purpose in those that demonstrate the capacity to do so. What my loved ones have done for me is what Bellarmine and the greater Jesuit community strives to do for the world of academia and beyond. As we continue to pursue our respective paths in higher education and in life, we will continue the ripple effect that we've started at Fairfield and elicit desire in each other and those around us, maybe the world as well. Thank you. Uh, good night, everyone. Hello. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, as Father O'Brien um, previously mentioned, my name is Ronaldo Fong, and um, I'll be sharing my experience with you guys. Ever since coming to the United States and finishing my senior year here, I was curious as to what awaited me after I graduated from high school. As a result of um, my student visa expiring after graduation, I didn't really have any options because colleges um, were skeptical about granting a student visa to a person who possibly couldn't pay the tuition in full and ones who accepted me outright, weren't, um, they weren't really giving me any money in awards or scholarships. Um, so at the time, I had no clue as to what I was going to do as it pertained to my education. Um, thankfully, Bellamin reached out to my guidance counselor, who then told me about the program, and I immediately jumped on board and said yes. Today, I would like to inform you pretty much about that. Um, so my mother and I essentially came out to America for a better life after the tourism industry in Jamaica came to a standstill due to COVID. As previously mentioned, I was granted a student visa by the Archdiocese, which allowed me to finish high school in a Catholic high school. Um, my mom works two jobs seven days a week, and she was barely around because of it. While witnessing this, I found it quite unacceptable um, to know she is sacrificing so much by herself, and that primarily because my drive to excel academically, um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, and because of this, it became my drive to success, um, success academically and in any other way I could. Um, my mother can be considered an angel that helps me to keep um, on track because of this. Upon entering Bellarmine, my initial expression was one that was not really expecting much, but I was excited to see what the program had in store for me. After coming into contact with the various people from different color, um, cohorts and faculty, my mind was put at ease just knowing that I have a home away from home. In addition, I have made friends that feel lifelong. Based on the principles that Sir Ignatius and the Catholic faith have implemented upon my journey through Fairfield, I can say they have taught me how to reflect and treat others better, as well as be more in touch with my faith and community. Overall, the concept of an angel can be equated to someone with exemplary conduct and virtue. I believe that my mother and the Bellarmine family are exactly that. Without these people providing that support for me, my life and plans for the future would be very different. It's now known to me that I have angels in both the open and in disguise, and I couldn't be happier. I thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Catherine Garcia Flores, and I am a first year um, business student at Fairfield University Bellarmine. First, let me start off uh, by sharing a couple things about myself. I am the oldest of three, 
and the first in my family to attend college. I am also from the small country of El Salvador. Now you're probably asking how I ended up here. Well, when I was seven years old, uh, my family and I decided uh, to immigrate and leave everything behind um, in hopes to achieve a better life. So here I am. Um, if there's one thing that I have come to realize as time has progressed is that I've been met with many opportunities and one of them has been uh, to be a helper for my community at St. Charles Borromeo Church. Through this experience, I have grown spiritually and I have learned to value not only those around me, but also myself. Um, apart from that, I've been fortunate enough to have a job. But most importantly, I've been blessed to have an education. Ever since I was little, I always had the aspiration of getting some sort of higher education, but deep down, I always knew that it was a distant dream for me because of my background. I still remember the day my guidance counselor called me down to her office and told me about this new program that aimed to help those of our own community. As someone who comes from a family where education, um, the education received has been high school level or lower, I immediately jumped at the opportunity. Now, as a student here at Bellarmine, I am motivated to complete my studies with the purpose of setting an example for my younger siblings, as well as for those of the Hispanic Latino community who have high hopes of achieving a higher academic level. I want to be able to prove that despite facing challenges as foreigners in this country, we are still capable of achieving greater things. With the opportunity that Bellarmine has given me, I plan on becoming a stepping stone for those who have similar aspirations and dreams as me. And even though the journey might be filled with tons of workload and exhausting days, the thought of one day being an inspiration and a form of encouragement for others really keeps me motivated. While at Bellarmine, I've learned the meaning of community. On campus, everyone has their own dreams and ambitions, but you are still able to find qualities such as inclusiveness, diversity, and most importantly, the eagerness to learn. We are incredibly lucky to be part of Bellarmine as it has granted us a chance to grow and develop ourselves for the future. In my case, I plan on graduating with my associate's degree, a degree and later on continue on until I am able to enter the field of business as an economics major. Economics, for the most part, is known to be a, a male-dominated field with only one-fourth of the workforce being women. Therefore, through this I aim to make the field, more wel the field more welcoming and inviting for other women. As you can see, I have numerous dreams However, with the support of my family and the help of Fairfield Bellarmine, I have faith that I'll be able to accomplish them all. Thank you. See, the hard part's over now. You get to relax, have a drink of water, take a deep breath. Now we're just gonna have a conversation with before 100 people, okay? And uh, I'm gonna, I have a couple of questions and then um, we're gonna invite your comments or questions, okay? Um, so Catherine uh, shared with us a little bit about where her future, she imagines getting involved in business somehow, not exactly sure what part of business, that's why you know, she's in the business program here. And, and to break some glass ceilings, way to go. Um, Ronaldo and Josh, you wanna share a little about, what do you imagine, what, do you have a sense of your, what your career holds for you, what you dream about doing? Um. Actually, yeah, uh, I was actually hoping to, um, after I get my associates, I was planning to come here to Fairfield University, finish up and get my bachelor's. Um, and I was hoping to become an RA. Um, um, I mean, um, an RA. Great. RN. My bad, my bad. Yeah. That's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so tell us, it's a registered nurse, right? Yeah. Okay, so you wanna, and is there a reason why you wanna be a nurse? Um, yeah, because um, ever since I was a kid, I always, used to go to the doctor's office and I always thought they're pretty much um they're pretty cool especially in Jamaica they are cool it's like a sought after career like it's either you're a doctor or a lawyer and you it's it's something that has a it holds a lot of respect 
um, in Jamaica. Um, I was always um, hype about the sciences as well. And my mom is also, um, she's a, yeah, she's a CNA, so um, I actually, that actually motivated me to pursue that path as well. Great. Yeah. Good. And Josh, you have a sense of what, what you want to do? Um, not really, if okay. I'm being honest. <laughs> it's a good answer for a first-year um, college student. Yeah, um, you know, in the span of two years, I went from wanting to be an architect to a dermatologist to a pilot and now an embryologist. So it's, <laughs> those are all like completely like completely different as you can see um but yeah right now i'm just you know i picked uh health studies slash nursing as a major because um you know it's very in demand um and yeah i'm it's not my end goal as a career but it's definitely something that um you know i could use to just like you know so that i'm doing something you know um right. Right. and then i could use that to uh i guess like launch myself into other prospective careers. Okay, yeah. good. Um, so we haven't rehearsed these questions, so these are spontaneous. So, <laughs> um, was there something? Think about your last, your first semester. So they're in their second semester yeah. to your program, and you should also know this is an eleven-month program. So they they only get one month off a year, but uh, most of our students are working as well. So. Um, and we are committed, and they are committed to graduating uh, within two years. So we're, they're doing a lot in two years. So, um, do you? Is there something uh, a class you took in the fall, or something you learned that stays with you? Something that really stood out? Was there a class or a lesson or something you learned in your first semester that really stands out for you now, as you look back? Something new or something different or cool? Or maybe it was just really hard, a hard class that you're grateful for. And your teachers are all here, but they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll go first. Um, so in my philosophy class. Oh, uh, that's Joe. Where's Joe? Yes. So, hey, yes. Joe Fernandez. <laughs> OK. Um, so in my philosophy class, um, at the beginning of the semester, we learned about, uh, sorry, um, he said something <laughs> along the lines of, you know, like philosophy does not, philosophy is not meant to console you. Um, mm -hmm. It's meant to make you like uncomfortable. Mm. Um, there's no like definite answer like everything sort of contradicts itself like if you have one opinion there's some other philosopher that's able to argue their opinion just as well and you know um despite that you know it also bought me a sense of comfort ironically because uh you know like this world like is just as confusing to navigate i think and mm. That was kind of like a good anomaly for me to yeah. keep in mind um, in that class and for life in general. So, yeah, that's great. So questions make us uncomfortable sometimes. They yes. Push the boundaries. It's, like, it's sort of what we talked about with the Majus, right? Sort of pushing the next question, pushing the next boundary. Catherine or Renault? I'll go there, next. Okay. Um, the class that, um, I'm not going to lie, the most challenging class that I've taken in a while um, it had to have been composition and rhetoric. Okay. Um, the way the way it's the way the class is structured, um, it really tests it really tests you and puts you out the box mm. to the point where you have to make connections that you wouldn't normally make. Mm. And as a result of this, um, I at first when I went into the class, um, I had a rough time adjusting because of the fact that. Um, I'm pretty much, um, I wouldn't call myself a basic person, but I'm quite literal, you know, one plus one is two, you know, yeah. I wouldn't just go out of my way to, you know, use imaginary numbers in my daily life, you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> yeah, so composition and rhetoric was exactly that. And it really tested my limits all the way up mm -hmm. to the finals where I had a B plus and then I broke that barrier and got an A. So uh, it was the hardest I worked for, yeah. but hey, you know what I mean? <laughs> Good. 
I know Lindsay's here. Uh, Lindsay or Darcy? Mr. Darcy. Mr. Dar I don't think DRC's here, right? Is it Darcy? But Lindsay or other comp professor is here. So Lindsay, where are you? There's Lindsay. <laughs> All right. Catherine. I am going to agree with Ronaldo on, on um, intro to rhetoric and composition. It was really hard. Um, it really forces you to look at things from a perspective you never really thought of viewing it from. Mm. And sometimes you think, oh, I got it. But then it's a completely different thing. Mm. So it really pushes you, like when I'll say, it pushes you to the limit to find something new in what you thought something actually was. Yeah. So I think that was really hard. I think it's, so it's like stretching your imagination, right? Yeah. Like beyond the literal, as Ronaldo was saying. Very good. Um, are there questions or comments that our, our audience would like to share? You can raise your hand. Nancy is running around. I have a mic here, mic. and my uh, Maggie has a mic over there. Maggie, you Maggie. have to turn it on on that little thing there. If you can see that little window on the side, push it up underneath. You're good to go. Uh, and we'll ask questions. I just have to say, I, since I'm holding the mic, I mean, <laughs> I'm really proud you're Fairfield students. You are just, this has just been wonderful to hear. I really, really appreciate it. And Nancy, as we said that, can I, I'm going to embarrass the rest of them. Can I ask other Fairfield Bellarmine students to please stand and just wave and get acknowledged? Come on, up here this way. Thank you. So it's it's a it's a it's a real community. It's if we speak about family, we don't. It's just not PR. It's like it sort of feels that way over there. So yeah, well, thanks, Nancy. That's great. And if you would say your name and then your question, please. My name is Dr. Edward Powers, Fairfield class of 1963. Wow. Uh, medical doctor. <laughs> I'm a medical doctor. But I've spent some time around lawyers. And this may be something that Father O'Brien knows a little bit about, OK? But the lawyers say, don't ask a question unless you know the answer. So I noticed in the mission statement for Bellarmine, it's a Jesuit and Catholic education. It's not a Jesuit comma Catholic education. It's a Jesuit and Catholic education. And I know there's a tradition of an ecumenical movement among the Jesuit colleges to have representatives of all the faiths, Catholic, Protestant, mm -hmm. Jewish, Muslim, et cetera. I'm wondering for the students and for Father, if you see this as a positive thing, how is it positive? And have you seen any barriers to that interfaith dialogue. Thank you. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we are very intentional about the mission statement, which we will revisit every year. But uh, we are committed to being a, a place, a hospitable place for people of all faiths or no faith background. Um, our students, like on uh, the in the four-year programs, they identify their religious affiliation if they choose. Many don't. Um, Nakia is here, so she probably knows the data better than I do. Uh, Nakia, where's Nakia Latang? Nakia's in the back. Hey, Nakia, our director of admissions. That's uh, <laughs> Nakia is the reason. Nakia is the reason that that these 44 have come to Bellarmine. I mean, they trusted her. Um, so we have that great commitment, and people of all different backgrounds. Uh, of our 44, it gets a very small sample. Uh, most identify as Christian, about half Catholic, half uh, different Protestant traditions. Um, we have two Muslim students and some unaffiliated. Um, we are currently generating our campus ministry program. Campus ministry is, uh, we have a campus ministry presence at, at uh, Fairfield, what we're trying, at Fairfield Bellarmine. What we're trying to do is develop a rhythm of life there to see, you know, when, like we just started a Bible study, an ecumenical Bible study we have a men's group and a women's group, which is spiritual more than religious, so people from all backgrounds. So we're really just developing our campus ministry program. Um, do you want to mention anything about where faith might come up at Bellman, what your experience has been? Does it come up? Um, you can be, just yeah, I'll go again. Be true. <laughs> okay. Um, well, um, 
I don't know if this is just Bellarmine in particular. I think it's all of Fairfield University, like the religion department specifically. Um, but shout out to Professor Harper. Um, yeah, where's Ryan? There's Ryan. Ryan. Ryan's <laughs> our, one of our religious studies professors. Stand up, Ryan. There you yeah. go. There you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that class in particular, um, I've only been in it for a little more than two weeks now. But, um, you know, the class is called Religion in the Critical Mind. And, uh, you know, due to like certain life circumstances, I, I identify as agnostic. Um, for those that don't know, I'm pretty sure that uh, you don't really claim faith in a god, but you don't like disclaim a faith either. Um, so I really enjoy that class because it helps me to, um, you know, you know, like we know that religion has been like such an important thing for the development of like humanity. Like we probably wouldn't be here without it because, you know, religion gives us hope and humans can't survive without hope. Um, however, um, as humans, uh, you know, n nothing is perfect. And, uh, you know, that class helps to like analyze like the unperfect stuff. Um, mm. And I, I find like real value in that, mm -hmm. so. Thanks, Dos. Yeah. Catherine or yeah. Rivaldo? Um, in terms of religion um, and the faith, pretty much, um, every day I walk into, um, every day we have class and I walk inside those walls, um, it always sets a tone for me because of the fact that we incorporated a lot of the church inside um, or facility mm -hmm. as well. Um, yeah, if you take a visit and come down there, you can see that for yourself as well. So please come. Um, <laughs> yeah, it really sets that tone for me where it's a case where we can both um, learn in such a sacred environment, if I would do say so myself. And um, growing up in the Seventh-day Adventist faith, um, that's something that really um, pushes me, I guess, you could say. Thank you. And Catherine, you mentioned you, uh, your family is very active at St. Charles Barmero, which is uh, a great feeder parish for us. Do you, you want to talk about the role your faith has in your education? Uh, it really serves as an encouragement, I guess, uh, the values that I have grown up with. I somewhat find them in Bellarmine. Um, the fact that we're in a facility that it was previously a church, it makes me feel like I'm not far mm -hmm. from church or my spirituality. It makes me feel connected in a way. So I guess it's more inviting to me. Mm. But, I, but with that aside, I also do feel that Bellarmine is very diverse and we're very mixed with people from different backgrounds, people from different faiths and religions. It's more about what we get from it more as um, education. Mm. It's not really about, we don't focus on the faith right. Right. as we don't label, yeah. but we do <laughs> learn from it. Yeah. And I think that's what really catches my attention. Good. Thank you. Um, so Francois has been helping me with the slides. So Francois, can you just stand for a second? Sir Francois is a Jesuit novice here for the uh, semester. He's a, <laughs> welcome. Uh, so he'll, t in 10 years when he's ordained, he'll be back at Fairfield. <laughs> Mark has offered him a job tonight, I heard. Um, Sir Francois, can you just flip back to the building or is it the next slide, the building or the, there it is. So that's, uh, I wanna just show you that because Ronaldo and um, Catherine mentioned it. This is our campus, it's on Mill Hill. It's the highest point of Bridgeport. So that church-like looking building, that St. Ambrose Church, 100 years old, that's their classroom building. So our fabulous architects and folks and facilities, they renovated a, a historic church into a classroom building. And one thing I asked is that they preserve as much as possible the sacredness of that space to honor the tradition of that parish for 100 years, but also to, to remind ourselves of our mission. And so when you go in, stained glass and you know, all the features are there, it's pretty cool. And I, I think it's you know, Josh also inviting for people who are not 
who are not res religiously aligned. It's a, you know, a safe, comfortable, it's a welcoming, it's different. It's different than any classroom building I've ever been in. So mm -hmm. that's part of what um, they're referring to. Good. I have another question. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You just brought back some memories for me. In the 60s, Fairfield University had a quote, five-year program. And the purpose of that, it was government funded. We got money from the government. We had to volunteer to teach in that program. And our job was to prepare these students, accelerated so that they would be able to enter the university and continue their studies. Unfortunately, when the funding ended, so did the program. So I'm thrilled to see what you are doing. It's far more ambitious. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Winston. Yeah. Yeah. So there are some antecedents. Do we have other questions? Here's a question particularly, over here. Particularly from a, a student who's er, trying to earn extra credit. Right? <laughs> if, you, if, you, if there's a student here who'd like to ask a question, I'm going to privilege them at this moment. Uh, any students who want to put your hand up here? You are not a student. You're an alum. OK. Going, going, going. OK, if you would say your name first. Yeah, I'm Scott Davis. When I read your book about Father Boyle, about eliminating the uh, borders, or the making everyone sort of come together. I forget it, I read that a few months ago. But the idea of, of eliminating the borders, uh, how does that help in your mission? Because it's the, right. you, I think you So uh, you're wisely referencing my latest book, Seeing with the Heart, <laughs> <laughs> which is available on Amazon. Uh, yeah, so um, no, it's a reference to Greg Boyle, who's done such great work in, in Los Angeles. And he has this beautiful note that our job as, as uh, in the Jesuit world is to, in the church is to go to the, to the margins, not, not, not so, I'm sorry, is not, is, is, our job is to go to the margins, not so that we then bring people back to our center, is that we create a new center on those margins, sort of a revolutionary turn. It, it's a lovely image for me. And I think, well, geography matters. And, you know, Mark and, our, and the board and our founding team made a firm decision that we want to be in Bridgeport um, because we want to create a new center that's going to help us look differently as a university and help us be a part of the city and its dreams. All of you live in, are you, all of you in Bridgeport? Josh, Bridgeport. So you're all from Bridgeport, all in, living in Bridgeport now. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me, um, what is it that you dream for that city? What is it that you want for Bridgeport? Do you imagine staying there when you're done? Do you imagine leaving? Is there something you imagine for Bridgeport that this, this school could be a part of? Um, actually, yeah. Um, what I dream about, um, when I pretty much look at the Bellarmine campus and I look at Bridgeport, I think of our school as a beacon. Hmm in a sense where we can make a change for the better and further impact the future generations so that they know that there is a way out if they think there is none. Mm. So, um, yeah. Okay. Catherine or John, anything to add to that? Catherine? I, I say that Bellarmine, um, we, I, we definitely want to eliminate stereotypes mm. of our city. Yeah. There are a lot of um, titles given to it. Mm -hmm. So I think um, Fairfield Bellarmine is really op an opportunity to bring people of other cities and towns into mm. Bridgeport and so that we could eliminate um, that image that the whole society, I, I'll say, um, has of Bridgeport. Yeah. About, 30, about 65, if I have this right, Nikia, 65 to 70 percent of our students, this class is from Bridgeport. So there's about 30 percent who are from outside of Bridgeport. So in the next class, uh, we have more than doubled our admissions rate for next year. So we're really, there's a lot of great uh, momentum for happening for next year. And those, th that, the pool has expanded also. But we have a commitment to Bridgeport, so we, we will always, I, I, as long as I'm there and our team is there, I think we have a deep commitment that um, 
the majority of our students are from Bridgeport. We're just around Bridgeport because of our commitment to that city. Josh, anything to add on the Bridgeport thing? Um, yeah, so uh, one, I guess one, what was the question? Yeah, what is it that you dream for Bridgeport? Do you imagine working there, staying there, going away, coming, I mean, or what can, what can Bellarmine do for the city of Bridgeport? Yeah, um, you know, as everyone else stated, you know, Bellarmine is really, um, it's giving something to Bridgeport and like breaking barriers um, and, you know, eliminating stereotypes. I think that's really important. Um, but, you know, like for Bridgeport as a whole, um, you know, I grew up there and, you know, uh, I'm, I'm slowly starting to see um, that like things are like changing in a way. Um, some would argue for the better and others would argue for the worst. I'm not really sure. Um, mm. But, you know, what I mean by that is like, you know, like gentrification, like that's a huge issue. Yeah. And I'm really glad that people are starting to like push for Bridgeport um, mm. and, you know, like revitalize it to the like epicenter it was at one point. Um, I just hope they, you know, do, they achieve that without, uh, you know, destroying the community that, that's been there for so long. Yeah. Amen. Um, Amen. So, yeah. Uh, Melissa Kwan is here. Oh, she's standing in the back. So Melissa is, uh, is the executive director of our Center for Social Impact, who's been so important in, in building relationships between Fairfield and Bridgeport for many, many years, having been a Jesuit volunteer in that great city as a young person, a younger person. Um, <laughs> But Melissa and I, we would, we and uh, our team would go to, and have community meetings in Bridgeport. And the refrain we heard was, "You can come here, but don't don't leave." Right? It was, "If you come here, you're going to stay here." And um, that is our commitment. We're not going anywhere. So thank you. Other other questions? Uh, you know, and I would love to hear at some point to come to Fairfield Bellarmine and have you tell us what you love about Bridgeport, to sort of share your love for the city so that you know we can see anew, if we don't live in Bridgeport, how beautiful it is, what's going on there, where are the lively communities, why your families are thriving there. I think that matters. I have a question here from the president of the university. <laughs> now, would, now, would a student like to cut him off? I don't <laughs> think so. And it's actually not a question, it's more, I, I feel I was remiss in not um, commenting on one thing, but I'll ask Kevin to comment um, on the fact that we've done this not just in partnership with the community, but also with the diocese, which is actually exceedingly rare um, in Jesuit Catholic education. So if you wanted to just comment on a relationship sure. with the diocese. So are the, di this, this is, uh, the diocese is a true partner in this. I think Anne McCrory is here from the diocese. Uh, there's Anne. Uh, so from the beginning, the, the, this all started because Mark wanted to, to innovate higher ed, wanted to start a school like this here. The bishop wanted to um, start a Catholic community college in Bridgeport, which I believe is Sacred Heart began as, as a community college. So he wanted to sort of go back to those roots. He wanted to create access for students uh, graduating from Colby. And I should say, um, uh, Josh is a grad of Fairfield Prep, I think he said. Ronaldo, Colby, Colby and Central? No, Bullet, Bullet Havens. Havens. Bullet Havens, sorry. Um, and he also wanted a place, a feeder uh, university for some students from the Catholic high schools in his diocese. So they were engaged in the beginning and uh, that, that property is, is owned by the diocese. So the bishop is our landlord. Uh, and uh, we're taking very good care of the buildings, Anne. <laughs> Um, and uh, th so the, the feeders, uh, Nikki will tell us that some of our strongest feeders are coming from the Catholic schools, which we're proud of our Catholic parishes. Jerry Blaschik and Nikki and a bunch of others went down to St. Charles Borromeo one night and spoke to both English speaking and Spanish speaking communities there about Bellarmine. So we're just really, it's a really great, vibrant relationship. And, and again, the property is perfect, perfect for us. Um, and we want to, we acknowledge the heritage of the diocese. So. Thank you, Anne, for being such a good landlord. Don't raise our rent next year. <laughs> Other questions? Maggie, please. 
Anna, introduce yourself. Oh, um, my name is Anna. I feel like we should, do you wanna? Okay, my name is Anna. <laughs> um, I wanna know, what's your favorite part about Bellarmine? Okay, Anna's a first year student. Yay, okay, from Shelton? What is your first, is your first, it's your favorite part? Yeah, what's your favorite part? Oh, about. oh you're asking us here. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> um, I'll go first. Uh, my favorite part of Bellarmine is definitely the small class sizes. Um, you know, I feel like a lot of schools use smaller class sizes um, as like marketing, but um, you know, this, like Bellarmine, the class sizes are actually really small. Um, and we're also with the same uh, like group of students for each class, um, some exceptions. Um, and I think that's like, I don't think I'll ever receive an education in a setting like this like ever again, to be honest. Um, so I'm really trying to like utilize it to the best of my advantage. Um, like, you know, I don't struggle to speak up in class anymore. Um, mm -hmm. That's a concern that I'm pretty sure most or every student can relate to. Um, and yeah. Hmm. yeah. Um, my favorite part about Bellarmine would most definitely have to be um, that one-on-one -on -one, um, connection that you could build with your professor um, because of the fact that the class size is also so small. Um, I feel like I could send an email out to any of my professors and they could get back to me like within the day unless I text, um, I mean, I email them at like 12 in the night or something like, you know, I'm not gonna get a response until like probably like nine in the morning, but yeah, for the most part, um, I'm almost guaranteed a response and they're always so, um, they're always understanding. So in case um, anything pops up, as long as I let them know like way ahead in advance, there's always some room for negotiation, if any. Um, yeah, and the food, well, the food too. <laughs> <laughs> Good, like that, and the food. Catherine. I also have to agree with the fact that it feels very intimate, that uh, feeling that we're small, um, group. Uh, I also really like the fact that um, our professors, I relate to them in some sort of way. I, hmm. I look at them and I feel as though I could become like they are. Hmm. I, I see an example that I can follow and I, hmm. and I really like about the ability. Beautiful. Great. So I know we're reaching the end Yeah, I have a question back here. Yes. Yeah, how about one Hello, my name is Brian Callahan. I have two questions for you. Um, first question, this is a small campus as you've all mentioned, but I'm curious about how you as classmates, because part of a first year college experience, unfortunately, is losing classmates who don't make it. And so in a Catholic Jesuit institution, what are you doing to make sure all of those classmates make it. Uh, I'll ask the second question afterward. Well, um, I can say for one that because of the fact that um, our class size is 44, um, we pretty much all have no problem, like, you know, hanging out after school and getting to know um, each other socially. So um, we're pretty much all familiar with each other and one thing that I've noticed since I've been here is that the support system here is really, really good. Um, you could pretty much go to anybody, whether um, it's a classmate or faculty, and they will be some of your biggest fans to um, that you ever have. So I feel like with everybody motivating each other um, consistently and rooting for your, um, each other, I feel like um, I feel like that kind of gives everybody the push. Um, and that motivation that they must, you know, um, succeed because I mean, I know it gets hard as so I know it gets hard sometimes, but um, just gotta see it through to the end. Yeah. I think that. Um, yeah, to? I'll say. Uh, wait, sorry, what was the question again? About oh, sorry, retain <laughs> about helping each other succeed and and, right. and come back and. Okay. Um, yeah, I I'll say that. Uh, a large part of uh, 
that is, you know, there's so much at stake for us. Um, I think I speak for everyone when I say that. Um, and then there's also the fact that, um, you know, like I have, I've made a lot of friends that, you know, keep me in check. They hold me accountable. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's, that's that plays a big role in my success too. So, yes. Catherine, you think that? Oh, I guess the fact that we're just, we we're sticking together and even if you don't share classes with someone, we always see each other in the hallways or we have events and it's sort of like a huge family. So I think that's what brings us all together. And the fact that we're not all the same, so our um, stories are different. So I guess that's kind of something that connects us too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, for the administration side, uh, Dr. Pamela Rivers, who's our academic dean, and PJ Lucky, who's our dean of student life, uh, they're coordinating efforts on what academics call retention, that is, you know, supporting and helping our students succeed. Um, and so we like to say we surround our students with love. They probably feel it smothering sometimes, <laughs> but we... Uh, we just, we are rooting and caring and doing everything we can to support them, so. But you can, I, what I loved is that your care for each other is equally as important and your support for each other, that peer accountability. Loved hearing that. So, so I'll, I think we have, I'll, let his, I'll let my friend have one more question back here and then we would take one more question. Okay. <laughs> Father O'Brien, I think this one's probably more for you. Yes. Uh, and the staff. What are you thinking about the transition from Bellarmine to here? Because that's gonna be a very different experience for yep. these young people. Yep. Yeah, so we, uh, we are creating pathways uh, to four-year institutions for, for our students who wanna get a BA or a bachelor's. Not all of our students will. Some will choose to go directly into a career. So we have a, a pathway certainly into Fairfield's four-year programs. Um, so I say this publicly because this was the public commitment of the board uh, that uh, uh, each year at Fairfield University's four-year programs will accept 35 students a year fully funded, which is a great you know, commitment of the university as a whole to um, seeing our students through to a bachelor's. But we know some of our students will want to go elsewhere for different reasons. So we have our, we've announced uh, agreements with Albertus Magnus, um, which for instance has a criminal justice program, which we don't. Um, and then we just are, are, are will soon announce a pathway into Williams College, which is the number one liberal arts school in the country. Mm -hmm. And they want our students, so they're giving preferential admissions. So we're in the process of creating those pathways. So whether it's at Fairfield or elsewhere, our goal is, sorry, sorry to tell you this, we're gonna follow you <laughs> 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 to make sure you're eased to transition uh, to a four-year program because it's different. It's bigger, you lose the class size, you know, difference in, in socially, the demographic, demographic makeup, the diversity of the place, it's just all these differences we're gonna have to figure out. And we're gonna be with you and we're gonna, yeah, so we're committed to be with them after they graduate. Continuing to smother them with love. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have one more Sure, question. one more question, please. Thanks. Yes, Cece Donahue. Yeah, hi. First of all, thank you guys for your testimony and your witness to your experience at Bellarmine. Um, it's exciting hearing about your first year there, so I really appreciate you sharing your experience. I know, Catherine, you said that you go to school and you also have a job, and I know Father Kevin said a lot of the students have jobs. Can you guys just talk a little bit about your school work life balance? What is a day in the life look like? How many hours do you go to school? How many hours do you work? And then you have to study, you have to get all your homework done. That's a great question. Catherine, do you wanna start? Yeah. So I work in Milford, so it's quite of a drive. Um, and I work around 25 hours a week. Um, I do so because I want to. I, my mom is a single mom, and I also have two younger siblings. So it's important for me to help them. I feel that responsibility in me. It's quite hard to balance it all, but I just have that drive to one day be some, something in life, so that's really pushing me. So even if I stay up until like 2 a.m. doing assignments, it, 
that's that's what I want to do. That's it's it's what I have to do to get to where I want to be. So um, it could be challenging, but I manage. So, <laughs> <laughs> so our students are, are taking a full load, four classes. Yeah. So, and then two in the summer. Um, as it pertains to um, working and going to school for me, uh, I work at Chipotle. So, yeah, fast food industry. It's fast. Um, you don't really get, like, a break, if I do say so myself. I don't know if you could call it 30 minutes a break, but, hey, to each his own, right? Um, on average, yeah, I also, like, average, like, 28 hours a week. Um, I also do it, too, because I want to. Because I, if I'm not working that many hours, I don't see the point in going at all, so... Um, yeah, it, it gets, it gets rough, especially when it's like closer to midterms and finals and you have all these assignments that you have to, it's either you take an hour out of each day to devote time to do it. Otherwise it's going to creep up on you at the last minute and everything's going to fall apart. Um, so I feel like time management really plays a huge role in all of this. Um, and yeah. Mom, there's like a Jamaican saying that um, that my mom always says. It says um, if you want good, you know it's after run, which literally translates to um. I mean, if you want something, you gotta go get it. I mean, mm -hmm. it's gonna, it's not it always gonna be easy, but you mm -hmm. gotta do what you gotta do. Josh. Okay. Um. So yeah, I work part time at Whole Foods in Fairfield. So if you shop in the produce section, you might see me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, uh, yeah, um, I think everyone kind of touched on, you know, the main aspects, which are, like, time management, you know, that's, that's always been an issue for me, um, so, you know, I kind of have to, like, force myself at times to, you know, like, lock in and do what I have to do, um, and, you know, as I said before, like, I have, I, I'm grateful to have friends and faculty members that sort of help me do that. Um, and yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know. As everyone else said, you know, I don't need to work. Um, you know, I chose to work during school because, um, you know, I like buying things. Um, and also, <laughs> I do help out sometimes at home. So um, yeah, like when I can. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, wow, so much to feast on. So uh, I, I really, uh, so before the final thank you, uh, if you work at Bellarmine, so faculty and staff, or if you're a student, we're going to take a group picture uh, when this is over in the final goodbyes. If you would just join us in this corner, we'll take a big Fairfield Bellarmine picture. Um, Francois, would you go back to or the, the group photo? Um, yeah, so those are more of our students. Uh, at the ribbon cutting in October. I just want you to look at them, honor them. Their stories are as beautiful and sundry as the stories you've heard tonight. These are all exceptionally wonderful, good um, young people who we care deeply about. So I'm so grateful to share this stage with you. Thanks to all three of you. Thanks, Catherine, Josh. <laughs>